Oh, yes. The appreciator is here. And yeah, the, the, to keep everything the way I want it, this is going to be a longer than uh, regular show. And uh, I, I, I'm going to fix this somehow in the future. But uh, yes, we've been trying to keep the shows at around a half an hour. But this is a bigger appreciation this time around because I promised you guys some Jimbo. And uh, there are no more shorter episodes that uh, are in the early days of Jimbo, which is what I'm focusing on now, is is the golden age. Well, there, it's all a golden age, but I want to bring you, the, the, just pay the proper tribute to Jimbo, and uh, by uh, doing this, it, it makes me feel good. So what we've got is a classic 2015 earlier episode of Jimbo talking at you and and being an appreciator in his own right. He's he's part of the prototype. I really always enjoyed the way Jimbo could look at life, laugh and uh, laugh at himself, which is something I'm still learning. And and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, to, to, we all need to learn to loosen up just a little bit and laugh at ourselves. And it makes everything so much better. But for now, where we are going with this is direct to the past. And uh, a classic episode of Jimbo. And I will be back with more uh, drivel and stuff and appreciation. But uh, after this. Well, hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jimbo. It's Jimbo. How are you? I had uh, been on kind of a hiatus, you know. I, you probably don't think it's a hiatus, but it's a hiatus because I was in a, a groove and then all of a sudden the groove quit. And uh, all the things that were good all went bad, all went sour. <laughs> it just went sour, went bad on me. I don't know. It just happens sometimes. You you want to be entertaining. You want to be funny. And then you spit it out. And it's neither. It's just somebody talking. Blah, 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 blah. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to be funny and entertaining. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be burned out. I wasn't burned out, but... Sometimes you just are not funny and you need a break. You deserve a break today at McDonald's. We do it all for you. Well, who remembers that? Nobody. Uh, I was going back today and looking through Frank Edward Norris' old show notes. Sometimes I do that and I get inspired. But I was noticing all the references in there to Match Game and Charles Nelson Raleigh. He likes Charles Nelson Raleigh. And, of course, he does that laugh, that <laughs> wonderful laugh he does. He should do it more often. Frank, if you're listening, which you're probably not, but uh, if you are listening, please do the Charles Nelson Raleigh laugh more often. Every show, maybe. I wish I could do it. If I could do it, I'd be king of the world. King of the world. Charles Nelson Riley laugh. But only Frank has that laugh, so. I was talking to uh, my friend PQ the River. PQ River. And uh, was he was telling me that he used to uh, work at a, a place where he was in charge of the ski ball uh, machine, whatever, I remember going to some place when I was a kid and just having the ski balls and I would go and just, nobody would be around, and I'd go and put them in the 500 slot, just walk up to it and put it in there, and I got all these tickets and got toys and stuff, and they were crummy toys, but it was fun, I cheated, I cheated, I cheated at ski ball <laughs> and no one could stop me. <laughs> I had all these tickets and 
Uh, I don't remember what kind of prizes I won, but uh, they weren't very good ones. They were crummy. Crummy prizes. Crummy, crummy. Uh, speaking of uh, Pinky River, he did his uh, overnight show, uh, whatever it's called, uh, the Quake Reversal Satellite uh, Overnight uh, the, uh, Overnight Underground, or whatever it's called, uh, stupid, I, I can't remember the name of it, it's the Peaky River Quick Reversal Satellite, new show, nighttime thing, yeah, anyway, he was talking a lot about me in the last show that I heard, and I was like, uh, PQ, don't, you making me feel bad and stuff, so, you making me feel, uh, like uh I don't know. I, I was kind of I was kinda of uncomfortable with him talking so much about me on there, so uh uh I don't know exactly I don't know why exactly. I mean he apparently I influenced him. He influences me, so you know. It's it's I feel fortunate when I influence him, but you know, I think that happened. Uh we influence each other a lot, so uh. You know, I was thinking, I saw the, the uh, all these things you could do with a pressure pressure washer. And uh, my sister, her husband died about, uh, boy, I don't know how long it's going, six years ago, maybe. Anyway, she, uh, he had everything, uh, her husband. He had all kinds of tools, and he's one of these guys, you know, he could do anything. He was real talented. And he had all kinds of tools and knew how to use them. And so anyway, along the line here, after her husband died, she got his boyfriend, and uh, he stole all kinds of junk from her and him, and uh, stole her pressure washer. I was going to use it the other day, and, and no, it's gone. It's gone. No pressure washer. So what kind of boyfriends are you getting uh, mixed up with here? Uh, what are you doing there? Why do you have a boyfriend like that? You ever notice uh, how uh, weird geniuses are? If, if you know somebody that's a genius or you think of a genius in history and you know their background, you're like, ah, all these geniuses are weird, like... Uh, you know, I wrote down a few of them. Uh, Michael Jackson, for example. He was weird. I don't know if he was a child molester or not. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, who knows, right? We weren't there. But he was weird. We know that. He was weird. You know, the whole mask and the glove and the wearing the stupid uh, clothes he wore and uh, the, his marriages and all that stuff and the whole thing where he says out loud I like sleeping with kids and you know he was weird I all geniuses are weird like Walt Disney he was weird dude um uh Howard Hughes you know that's a genius he was a genius as far as aeronautics goes and uh he was weird and just all these people I mean, think of people, you know, I bet you could think of people on, on SUG that you would consider geniuses that are strange people. I know I do. I know there are several people on on SUG that, I mean, you get to know them after a while, and there are several of you folks on here that I would consider geniuses. And you're all weird. You're all weird. You're weird. I'm glad I'm not weird. I'm glad I'm not a genius. I'm not a genius, so I'm not weird. So, ha, 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 ha. I'm just a big goober. I'm a goober. One time I got food poisoning. I got food poisoning. Everybody got food poisoning. I got food poisoning. No, it was just, we had this ritual when I was married. I was married from the age of 22 to the age of 29. I was married seven years. My wife was killed. Anyway, 
Uh, but we had this thing where we went to Red Lobster on our anniversary. Red Lobster. I don't even really like Red Lobster, but I guess she did. So we went to Red Lobster, and, you know, I, I did like lobster. I did like shrimp. I still do. But I have not had lobster since this last time I went to Red Lobster when I got the food poisoning. I got the food poisoning there. She got the food poisoning. <coughs> We were not feeling good when we were there at the restaurant, so we took our food home and we gave it to the cats, and the cats got sick and uh, they died and had to bury them. No, they didn't die, but they got sick too, and we got real sick and had to miss work and got food poisoning. It's the only time I ever got food poisoning in my entire life, and that's my food poisoning story. That's it. Food poisoning story is over. <laughs> no, but the cats got sick too. Ugh. They got real sick. They got like doo doo sick. Not like throwing up sick, but uh doo doo sick. I don't like doo doo sick at all. Especially with a cat. Cat doo doo sick is Yeah. Now the other day I mentioned and Peaky mentioned this too because he he thought it was a cool story. I'm gonna tell you this whole story. About the time I found the $100 bill under the water melon. Okay. This is a tr absolutely true story. It doesn't sound like a true story, but it's a true story. Just, just you you got to believe me. And it's a really weird story. The whole story is weird, so I'm going to tell you the whole story. All right. I remember it was a summer day, and I lived in Amarillo, and my mother lived right next to Skaggs Alpha Beta. I did not live near Skaggs Alpha Beta. I lived about a mile away from her. Anyway, so I went over to her house, as I I did all the time. I, I'd go over to see my mom, you know. I love my mom. I love you, mama. I love you, mama. Mama, 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 sita, mama. No, my mom was good to me, you know. I mean, mama, mama. I love you, Jimbo. I love you, Jimbo. Jimbo, you little, little fat cheek, Jimbo. No, she loved me, you know. And one day, I went over there in the summertime. And she said, ah, oh, I'd like to have a watermelon. And I said, well, yeah, I was 20 years old or what, 19 years old, whatever. A big, strong boy. Hey, Mom, I'll go over and get a watermelon uh, for us at the Skaggs Alpha Beta. So, she gave me, I don't know, $5? I don't know. And uh, <laughs> I walked over to the, was going to walk over to Skaggs. And she lived right by Skaggs. I mean, like you could throw a rock, literally, and hit Skaggs. It was right behind her apartments. And so I went out there, and the first thing I encountered was a police officer and this woman uh, out there. And the police officer shined his light on me because it was kind of getting dark. And uh, I was like, uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And he said, uh, have you seen, did you steal a wallet? And I was like, nah, man, I just come from my mom's house. I'm going to go to Skaggs Alpha Beta and I'm uh, going to buy a watermelon. <laughs> and he was like, okay. And so the lady, there's a lady there. She's all looking at me like, uh. I don't know. And she actually had the wallet in her hand, so I don't know what was going on. But she was looking at me, and she said something. And I was just, I just kept walking because I didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what was going on. So I went into Skaggs, and uh, before I went to go look for a watermelon, I thought I'd go look at the magazines. They had a big stack of magazines there, and I, I love magazines. So I went to the magazine section, and I was looking at the magazines, and all of a sudden this lady came up to me. She was a little bit older than me, maybe 10 years older. And she came up, she said, oh, it's so good to see you. And I was like, looking at her like, I don't even know who this lady is, right? And I'm trying to figure out who she is. And she's like, I haven't seen you in a while. And she gave me a big old hug, and I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> And she says, uh, and she went on and on about uh, somebody, and I was like, ah, he, I didn't really say anything. I didn't say, uh, you know, you got the wrong person or anything. I was just like, uh, 
uh huh, uh huh. And she was like, uh, "You need to come over and see so and so." And I was like, "Yeah, uh -huh, yeah." Uh -huh. So anyway, she finally left, and I was like, well, "What was that all about?" You know. So, uh, and so I went to go look at the watermelons. Now I don't know nothing about watermelons or how to pick them out. My mother tells me, but doesn't do any good because I'm probably not listening or. <laughs> Just whatever, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to listen to my mom about watermelons. No, I probably she probably told me, but, you know, I was like, probably just wasn't listening. Probably just being out in the, you know. Sometimes I just don't listen. I just, my mind's somewhere else all the time, so. I went over there, and I uh, asked this dude, he was... I said, you know anything about watermelons? He was the dude that worked there, and he was like, yeah, I know what I know something about watermelons. And he and I said, well, what should I look for? And he told me, and I don't really remember what he said, but at the time I was listening. So he he left. He said, I gotta go do something, whatever. So I was like looking at the watermelons, and the the first watermelon was a small watermelon that I rolled over because I was gonna look at the bottom of it. That was a hundred, well, I thought it was a $10 bill. And I I looked around to see if anybody was looking, you know. I mean, was this a candy camera or something? I didn't know. And so I took the $10 bill, what I thought was a $10 bill. I did not get a watermelon. I promptly left the uh, Skaggs Alpha Beta, and I went home exactly the way I came. There was no cop out there this time. There was no lady. And I went into the house and where my mom lived, and I said, uh, she's like, where's the watermelon? I was like, well, I didn't get a watermelon because I kind of got distracted. I said, I found a $10 bill. And she said, you found a $10 bill? I said, yeah, it was a $10 bill underneath the watermelon. So I pulled it out, and it wasn't a $10 bill. It was a $100 bill. And I was like, hey, it's a $100 bill. And she was like, ah. Where did you get this hundred dollar bill? I was like, I got it underneath the watermelon over there. I was, I was looking for the watermelons, and there was a hundred dollar bill under there. I didn't know, and she's like, Ah, oh, come on, where did you get this money? I was like, I got the money from the, I found the underneath. She's like, Where did you get that? Did you steal this from the, from the store? Did you? I was like, No, I went over there to the store and the. There was a hundred dollar bill underneath the watermelon. I pulled the watermelon over, and there it was a hundred dollar bill. I was like, "Come on!" She's like, "Ah, right, come on, yourself. Where did you get that?" And she did not believe me. She just wouldn't believe me. I said, "Look, I'm telling you, it's. A, I found a hundred dollar bill under watermelon." Finally, I guess she believed me, but I don't know. She always had trouble believing me about money. I remember another time when. I lived in Dallas, and I came up, went up there to Amarillo to visit her when I was about, oh, 15 or 16. She had moved up there. And uh, she gave me, like, $20 to go get some hamburgers at the hamburger place, which was, I don't know, about a mile from where she lived. I was a real windy day, and I went and walked to go get the hamburgers. And when I got up there to where the hamburger place was, I found I didn't have any $20, and so I didn't have any do any money in my wallet, so, or not enough, and so I had to make the trek all the way back, and I told my mother I lost the $20. She's like, yeah, I lost the $20. What do you mean you lost the $20? I said, I lost the $20. I, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't do it on purpose or anything. I just lost the $20. I said, what do you mean you lost the $20? Ah. And, you know, $20 was probably a lot of money to her back then. And I'm sorry, but uh, somehow I lost it. I went and looked all over the place for the $20 for the, my walk back. And, you know, I was looking for it. I couldn't find it anywhere because it was gone. I don't know what happened to it. It must have blowed away or, stuff, or something, you know. The wind blowed it, and it went, it went into the... Down the Ethernet, down the Ethernet, down the Ethernet. That's where it went. It's just gone. I got some notes here. I wrote just wrote some notes down. I don't really know why, because I don't really need them, but I had written some stuff down. Uh, uh, one time uh, I worked uh, 
I think I mentioned this before. I worked uh, right when I, before I got married. I got a job at this uh, a big old gigantic apartment complex, which and it was a really big complex. I, it had to go on longer. It was at least a mile long. It was a great big, gigantic, rich apartment complex. I mean, celebrities lived there, like local celebrities, uh, people who worked for the news, people who worked for radio stations. I'd see them all the time. The sports guys, I'd talk to them. I got to know them. Uh, it was right across the street from a big, gigantic golf course. It was in Las Colinas, which is uh, like the rich part of Irving. And Anyway, I worked there, and uh, I got a really good salary working there. And uh, that was a place where I blew up on my manager and eventually quit. But she made me mad, I'm telling you. But anyway, I, that place was a really cool place. On uh, Christmas, or uh, for Christmas... They bought me this uh, radio, this this uh, portable radio that I could carry along with me. This had to have been like in 1986 or so. And, uh, you know, it was real nice of them to do this or and uh, whatever. And I was quite, quite proud of the fact that they thought of me and did this for me. And uh, I'd go out there and listen to the radio. I love listening to the radio. And... Um, would just listen to talk radio and the news. There was an all news station. I'd listen to the news. And anyway, I remember being out there listening when the space shuttle, I guess it was a Challenger, that blew up in eighty six, eighty seven, whenever it was. And uh, I just remember it blowing up and uh, hearing it live as it happened, you know. And I came back and told the people at work that. Uh, the space shuttle blowed up. <laughs> I say blowed up. I'm trying to talk like Peaky River. That's the way he'd say it. The, the space station blew up. And, uh, of course, all those people died and stuff. And, uh, anyway, I heard it live on the radio. And, uh, boy, that was exciting. No, uh, it was terrible. But I just, this is a memory. I just tell you this memory. I'm not making a big story out of this. And, Nothing funny happened. I didn't find any bodies or torsos in the trash or anything. But another thing about working at this uh, apartment complex was uh, one day I, I was out there and I heard this, this sound. And I, like, oh. I was like, what is that sound? And uh, they'd go away and then I'd come back, same area, and they'd go, oh. I was like, what is that? What is that sound? And then I realized there was a giant beehive in uh, one of these low-hanging trees. I mean, it was a real low tree. And uh, these uh, these bees were everywhere. Bees. I had to call the bee people to come and do something about it. I think I called the uh, fire department. I don't remember. Or I probably told my manager, and she went and called the fire department. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> but I found a giant beehive, and uh, it's one of those things I'll never forget, even though it's really not that important these days. I mean, I think about it like, yeah, big deal. Big deal. You know, I told you I buy from Walmart uh, online, walmart.com, and one of the one of the things they have in at Walmart, you can look this up yourself, is emergency food. It's called emergency food. And I thought, you know, it would be great when the apocalypse happens if I have some emergency food, right? So I went in there to look, see what constituted as emergency food, because I had no idea what was going to be in there. And what they had is these great big. Uh, giant buckets, like a gallon bucket of, like, dried onions and dried um, celery and dried uh, potatoes and <laughs> dried corn and stuff. Anyway, I, I bought some dried onions because I thought, you know, that dried onions, I could use that in my cooking. And, boy, can I and did I and have I. It's delicious. It's worked out well. And I bought some. also bought some uh, dried out um, bell peppers, which I don't use that often, but 
uh, I have some dried out bell peppers. And I smell the bell peppers sometimes. I was going there and just smell them. I open it up. Smell in there. Mmm. Feels like bell peppers. I'm going to take a drink of water, if you don't mind. Some water. Here I go. Ugh. That's me drinking water and burping afterwards. Uh, this morning, I got up early. The, one of the first things I did was I listened to some old Shambles shows. Hey, Shambles. And I also listened to some old PQ River stuff. And I got inspiration from that. And I listened to, of course, I listen to Frank Edward Nor all the time. And uh, I listen to you other guys. Chad Bowers, listen to him. Enjoy his shows. And uh, Meander, I listened to uh, his show the other day. And uh, listen to all you people. I mean, you know. Uh, Carrie Michelle, listen to her show. And uh, after I listen to her show, I just want to. I just want to smoke. Just want to smoke some marijuana. It's like, hey, I'm gonna get me some marijuana and smoke it. That's what she seems to be talking about. Some marijuana, marijuana. No, I guess it's legal up there where she's at, and I don't know her whole story, but it's all health related, right? So, you know, more power to her. Hope it helps with her health. It help with her health. I mean, if I had some uh, serious pains, I'd want some marijuana too. So, but if there you can get marijuana, it's not just smoke. You can get candy or whatever. I'm not sure if it's candy, but you can get concentrated bars or whatever. And that seemed like the way to go. I'd rather do that than smoke it. If I was going to consume it. But anyway, uh, also when I was looking at these old stuff. Uh, I found like some old, uh, 10 minute PQ River, uh, podcasts that he used. I mean, I get mostly music and I, his friend, Fruitcake Toothpaste, is that, is that how you say it? Doesn't sound right. Fruitcake Toothpaste. What kind of a name is that? Anyway, uh, I know there's a lot of music on there from Fruitcake Toothpaste and the, Conspiracy of the Insignificant Band, and uh, PQ River apparently knows all kinds of people. There, in truth or consequences, if that's a real name for a city, I don't know. Doesn't sound real. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I remember I used to fly all the time because my dad worked for the airlines, and so we would get to fly like free. All we'd have to do is pay for the taxes or whatever. So my dad would surprise me all the time. We'd fly places. Hey, let's go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I've told that story where he got me up one morning and we went to Cleveland and then took a a um, car down to uh, the Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And I met uh, Lou the Toe Groza and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was... Like a dream come true, basically. But we used to go to the airport all the time. I mean, and we go flying everywhere. I would, I'd been everywhere, man. I've been every, I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. If I don't know that song, but anyway, uh, I mean, I have been everywhere. And uh, I just remember when I was a kid, when I go to the airport, there'd always be these Hare Krishnas out there in the airport, like. Uh, with their bald heads and their tambourines, and they scare the fool out of me because I didn't know what was going on. I was like, "What's going on with this Hare Krishna baloney?" I didn't know, <laughs> did not understand. I did not understand what was going on. My dad was like, "Just stay away from them. Don't let them hit you in the head with their with their uh, tambourine, their green tambourine." Dun dun dun. I always do that when I talk about tambourines. I always do the green tambourine song. Yeah. You ever had your own business cards made up? One time I did. I had business cards and I felt like a big wig. Go hand them out to people. Hey, go to my studio and record in my studio. Here's my business card. I used to do that. Felt like a big wig. Felt, felt empowered. 
felt like a goober. A goober Jimbo. Go we go and reach a goober Jimbo, Antonio. Yay. Uh, there's some perils to having your own studio. I remember I bought a brand new Gibson guitar. It'd be the, the guitar, the studio for the guitar. I mean, the guitar for the studio, you know. Belongs to the studio. Anybody could use it. And, uh, I mean, it set me back, you know, $1,900 or whatever. And uh, had a big amp in there. And, you know, I did not buy a drum set, but I thought about buying a drum set. We had a we had a real studio. I mean, it was, I spend the bucks to do it. And, you know, a much better musician than I was, but he wasn't uh, a great songwriter. And uh, so we kind of worked together, you know. And uh, so, anyway, this guitar, I mean, it was a brand new guitar, brand new. And some idiot, like, the first day it was in there, picked it up and dropped it on the floor and broke a big old chunk out of the top of it. And, boy, just, you know, I was like, why does this stuff, why does this stuff happen to me? Why does it happen to me? Why me? Why? Why? You know, I I listen to all these uh, Frank Norn, Nora, Frank Nora shows from way back, early, early shows, and he talks about, and he has evidence of uh, having a tape recorder when he was a little, little child and recording himself, and I did the very same thing. I had a little tape recorder, reel to reel, a little small reel to reel, and then of course I had a cassette player after that, but I remember having this little reel to reel, and uh, I would like make up my own shows and stuff. I'd almost forgotten about it, but I did, and of course I laid a bit at night, influenced by old radio, and uh, by, uh, you know, people like Larry King, and Jimbo Hannon and Sally Jesse Raphael, and I think Geraldo Rivera, I think. And I would, you know, lay in bed and uh, have my recorder and I'd make up my own shows and just lay in there like an idiot and go to sleep and ah, wake up the next morning and listen to my stupid show. It'd be stupid, but I did it. I did it. You know, uh, P.Q. River, he lives out there in the land of what I would call Indian art. And uh, when I was a kid, man, we used to go to the Four Corners area lots of times for vacations. I bet I've been out there five or six times. And remember Indian Indian art, and I really appreciate Indian art. And uh, P.Q. knows some people that do that kind of thing. and It's just mind-blowing how talented some of these people are I wish I could do that I wish I could wish I was artistic in some way but uh I can't draw and I can't you know Peaky River he can draw and he draws cartoons and he, he does this and, and Frank had his own comic book for a while and did drew cartoons and I can't draw nothing I can't draw nothing I can't draw anything. It's really uh, disappointing that I am so untalented. Just, I don't, I, I feel bad. I feel stupid, really. I mean, some of these people, some of you people out there can draw so easily. And just, it's a shame and I can't, I can't draw nothing. Any, I can't draw anything. I mean, it's terrible. And you people do your little show art stuff. I mean, you see my show art it looks stupid. It looks dumb. Yeah, it looks dumb. When we used to go to the Four Corners areas, you know, there's a lot of mountains and stuff up there, and my mother was real nervous about <laughs> everything, really. Uh, she actually had a nervous breakdown, but when I was a kid, that meant nothing to me. All it meant to me to me was 
let's go full mom that we're gonna go like we're gonna uh fall over the mountain, slide down the mountain, she's gonna go crazy and it'll be fun to watch and so me and my cousin do that and she beat the tar out of us. Beat the tar out of us with a belt. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to stop you from fake falling. I'm going to beat the crap out of you. And that was cool, you know. It was no problem because I deserved it. I <laughs> deserved it. I did. You know, when you fool mom like that, you pretend like you're falling down a mountain. That's not fun. That's not. That's not a cool thing to do. And... I realized that after about 13 or 14 times of doing it and getting beat, I was like, I better not do this anymore because uh, I shouldn't. You know, when I was uh, when I was doing that, I noticed that the next uh, central um, subject is about collecting and collections and whatnot. One of my collections was I collected rocks. And I don't want to give away too much because I'm going to talk about my collections in the next Overnight Overnightscape Central. Or did I say that right? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, I don't know the names of these shows. I'm just an idiot. So uh, we collected rocks, and I remember uh, seeing gold for the first time. Not that I found any gold. I remember going panning for gold, but I didn't know what I was doing. And my dad certainly didn't know what he was doing. And so we panned for gold and didn't find any gold. But we'd go to the, like, it'd be like a store or something in that area. Maybe a, a supply place where you could buy uh, gold gold digging supplies or whatever. I don't know. We were right in the, I mean, right in gold country. You know what I'm saying? It was... You know, like, the people who used to dig for gold there all the time are paying for gold, and it was that area. And I remember going in there and seeing gold for the first time and knowing what it was, and, and the guy showed me in the rock, and I was like, this is gold? I don't care anything about this. I don't want to do gold anymore. I want to get something else. I don't like gold. You know, even pyrite, like fool's gold, that was like, to me, it was like 20 times better than any kind of gold I could find. It was so cool. I'd find pyrite that was like a gigantic piece of pyrite that fit in my hand. It'd be all sparkly. And I'd look at it and I'd be like, ah, oh, look at this. And my dad'd say, it's just fool's gold. I didn't care. I didn't care if it was fool's gold. To me, it was all sparkly and I liked it and I wished I had more and I want more and more and more and more. Much more than I wanted any piece of gold. Gold smoked. Gold was ugly. I wanted some fool's gold. It's awesome looking. Or I'd get a geode and knock it in half, and I'd be, oh, look inside this geode. There's all kinds of pretty, pretty stuff in the geode. <gasps> oh, look at it. And it was way prettier than silver or gold to me. It was like awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, my parents were like, yeah, big deal, big deal. And I remember this street in Colorado, and I'm not kidding you. I do not remember the name of it, but we could look it up because I know that Lowell Thomas, the newscaster, was born in this town. And uh, anyway, there was a street, and they said on the street, you could find uh, amethysts. Our, our turquoise, I really don't remember now which one it was. Turquoise, I believe. You could find turquoise on the street. And so here I was looking on the street trying to find turquoise. And you know what I found? Instead, of, I mean, I found some turquoise. And that was sort of exciting. But I found arrowheads. Arrowheads and petrified wood. And I was like, now this is, this is an anomaly. Here I am looking for turquoise. And I found arrowheads and petrified wood. I mean, I found a great big old petrified wood log that was enormous. It had to be worth something. It was awesome. It had a little piece of crystal in the middle of it. I'm not kidding you. And I, I was so excited. I was showing my parents and they were like, yeah, way to go, Jim. 
And then I found out later they did, that they put it there and made me find it, and that I felt so ripped off, ripped off, and felt bad. And what are you doing, mom and dad? Are you you trying to hurt my feelings? You trying to hurt my feelings? They hurt my feelings. Is what they did. Yeah. You know, uh, Frank's always talking about the malls he used to live in, or used to go to. <laughs> Not live in. I, I live in a mall. Uh, I have to. I have to tell you the, about the time I used to live in a movie theater, but that's for another time. I'll tell you that one another time. Also lived in a closet, but uh, we'll get to that. I promise you. Not today, but we'll get to that maybe next time. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the mall, it was a mall where I lived. It was called the Irving Mall, and it was brand new. I remember going in, into it when it was new, and, it, and there really wasn't anything like the mall. Like you'd go in the mall, and it'd be all gigantic and have these uh, escalators and all these people. But the, the best part was... Yeah, Frank always talks about the food court. There was this pizza place, and it was not in the food court. It was it was just a pizza place that was there. And I have never found any pizza like this uh, since then. It tasted like garlic, and it was delicious. It was, oh, so good. And uh, I do not remember the name of that place, but they had... Uh, Every time I went to the mall, every time I'd get a piece of that pizza, it cost about 50 cents or a dollar, I don't know. But, uh, man, it was so good. And nothing, no, no meat on it or anything, just that garlic and cheese. And, oh, man, it was delicious. And my dad used to buy me a piece every single time. And, uh, also, there was an Orange Julius there, and we'd get an Orange Julius, and of course that was the only place you'd get it, and it kind of tasted weird, but it was still good, and it's still one of those flavors that you, that I think of anyway that I have in my brain that just won't come out. <laughs> it's just stuck in there. Mmm, Orange Julius. So I reckon my time is up, at least I'm going to try to keep this in about 40 minutes, so. I'll talk to you more at another time. I'll tell you some good stories. So, I'll see you later. Later, later, later. I'll see you later. Bye. And, uh, yeah, you like the air conditioner? I, I like the air conditioner. It, it, it saves lives out here in the desert. And it is true there are consequences in New Mexico, but... Um, yeah, the, the, it's just so good hearing Jimbo talking about watermelon, and, and, and just, he's, he had such a flow. There, there are a few people, I, I envy people who just like to have this flow, and they're going, and they're talking with what we call rambling, just rolling along with that night radio, fascinating storytelling and commentary. And uh, the music underneath here is is a Jimbo thing. And, and if you can figure out the lyric, um, that, that please tell me what the lyric is. Abrupt end. Well, that, that, oh boy, that, that I am not going to say the obvious ironic thing, but the, a taste of Jimbo's music. Uh, usually, it was a little more upbeat and whimsical. And th I will find some better stuff that was kind of found pretty fast and on the fly. And like I said, the big appreciation is on the way, and that's just going to be a showcase for a lot of bigger format stuff. And bringing back the feel of night radio is what I would like to aim at 
uh, as I continue to do internet broadcasting, because that's really important. And I was going to talk about Nick Cage films, and I took a look here at Nick Cage's filmography, and I mean, I am not... He's made so many movies, and I don't think I've seen very many of them at all. I thought I had seen him in more, and maybe I'm, like, getting titles forgotten. But really, uh, the best one that I can recommend, and I will give you this if you haven't seen it, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, which is a kind of, if you saw being John Malkovich. he It's a playing oneself and uh, a, almost a parody of his career and his outlook. And he's just such a character in real life from everything I've heard. So uh, that will be my Nick Cage. I thought I was just going to drivel for a whole show about Nick Cage. And well, that's not going to happen because I would just be riffing and we don't need to riff when we have all of this other stuff um another failed project well at least temporarily on hold for a while earlier this year i was determined because i had sort of gotten into old-time baseball and the aforementioned uh sim league that i'm still a part of but that seems to have i don't know the draft that they did for it was a lot of fun, but the actual playing out of the season seems to have lost some sort of momentum. I mean, I go in there, and uh, again, I mention Beatles Eternally is the name of his channel. Uh, and he doesn't do stuff about the Beatles, oddly enough. He does old-time baseball on that channel and replays and plays of various baseball sim games. And the fun there is in the chat. Uh, chat rooms have really, for me, and for a lot of people, I suppose, been replaced by these live feeds on YouTube and a community of people that type back and forth to one another in the chat. And, hey, check out Beatles Eternally and that. But while I was doing that, I decided that I was going to pick a Major League Baseball season, go back to the amazing availability of old newspapers and do a day-by-day -day look at a Major League Baseball season from way back in the day and wound up choosing 1911. And the series is on the OnSug at onsug.com. It is me going over basically the preseason of 1911. Uh, I just had gotten to the opening day and the whole thing seems to have lost momentum and I started this and I'm doing the overnight scape underground and I gotta be honest I really don't see when I'm going to get back to baseball 1911 uh, it's a thought it's something I really should do at some time but it was basically a lot of reading and these newspapers, I mean, if it piques your interest, you can go and find the day-by-day -day newspapers. I even tell you what newspapers I was looking in. So, I mean, it's not as nice as a guy reading it to you and making some uh, comments and commentary. But I, I really want to focus on this, the big appreciation, and keeping the Overnight Scape Central going. Uh, that's more than enough. So uh, keep an ear open for that. I do have another little bit of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the philosopher and former emperor of Rome, to read you. And uh, yeah, let's read that selection now while I'm thinking of it. This is uh, from Meditations, Chapter 2, uh, Section 16. The soul of a man harms itself first and foremost when it becomes, as far as it can, a separate growth, a sort of tumor on the universe, because to resent anything that happens is to separate oneself in revolt from nature, which holds in collective embrace the particular natures of all other things. Secondly, when it turns away from another human being or is even carried as far in opposition as to intend him harm, such is the case in the souls of those gripped 
by anger. A soul harms itself, thirdly, when it gives in to pleasure or pain. Fourthly, whenever it dissimulates, doing or saying anything feigned or false. Fifthly, whenever it fails to direct any of its own actions or impulses to a goal, but acts at random, without conscious attention, whereas even the most trivial action should be undertaken in reference to the end. And the end for rational creatures is to follow the reason and rule of the most venerable archetype of a governing state, the universe. And in those days, I think the universe was the world that you see and experience, although they were kind of cosmic in their own way. So maybe he is referring to the whole thing. But again, he is really looking at what I'm looking at, really trying to understand things instead of reacting negatively to them or giving them any more energy than they need to have. And uh, it's that's why he calls them meditations. And any thoughts uh, you might have, on the meaning of this, I'll be more than happy to discuss or uh, mention. Uh, just in general, uh, my time management is changing so much uh, over the last few months, and it will continue to change because I'm working on all kinds of things, both uh, on SUG, as I mentioned, and real outside, non on SUG, non. Uh, public creation projects. I, I really, now that I have made all these changes in my life, want to do some more out-of-the-box experiences, maybe even eventually uh, getting enough escape velocity to leave truth or consequences and do other things in other places. And I intend on taking you guys along if you're with me for the ride. So uh, my time management is getting really weird. I'm sleeping a lot less now that I uh, have changed my lifestyle. I was sleeping way too much. Uh, no human being needs to sleep nine, ten hours a night unless you're bored. I mean, during COVID, there was almost an excuse. But even then, even though I was doing it, I can't make or construct a particularly good excuse for that. And uh, I, I mean, I would just have these incredible and strange dreams that all I remember are little bits of anyways. I mean, I know I enjoyed them. And at the end of it, I'm really dubious whether dreams mean anything. It's just kind of a backwash that the brain kicks out. And I suppose it's uh, some sort of therapeutic thing because we do it. And people I've read who are deprived of dreams don't do so good. So there's that. But uh, again, time is being remanaged. Um, and if I had all the time in the world, I would be doing a lot more stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, I, and uh, speaking of old time radio, I was considering, I mean, we are going to have a lot of Vic and Sade here. I've made the decision myself because we need this. The world needs Vic and Sade. But uh, there were other things on the radio and the soap operas ran at about the same time as Vic and Sade and I figured I uh, would find an example of one of these programs and share it with you here on the show. Kroger presents Mary Foster, the editor's daughter, transcribed. I'm not a magician by any manner of means. Can't pull rabbits out of a tall silk hat. But I can let you in on one mighty good trick. How to save money on one of our most important foods and still enjoy a plus when it comes to quality and value. Of course, I'm talking about Kroger's clock bread. Quality, freshness, flavor, and wholesomeness are guaranteed, and you can still make big savings. Two, three, and four cents a loaf. That's the kind of money you can save on Kroger's clock bread. And if you'll serve this miracle value regularly, you'll find you can be anywhere from 75 cents to a dollar a head at the end of only one month. If you use more than the average amount of bread, 
you can save more. You can be not only money ahead on clock bread, but ahead on quality and freshness, too. Clock bread, you know, is the famous time-controlled loaf, the loaf that is actually clocked from oven to truck to store for hours of greater freshness. It's better tasting, purer, and safer, too, because every ingredient is laboratory tested by food experts to make sure of top quality and wholesomeness. And listen, ladies, you can try a loaf of this sensational bread without risking a penny. The clock bread guarantee says you must like it as well as or better than other bread, or you may return the unused portion in its original wrapper and get your money back. Next time, buy clock bread, spelled C-L-O-C-K. Now for our story. In the previous episode, we learned that Mary Foster went to see John Dennison and was told by Judith Bond, John's nurse during his recent illness, that she and John were to be married. Naturally, this was quite a shock to Mary, who was still in love with John, despite the fact that she broke her engagement to him over a difference of opinion a short while ago. The time, as today's episode opens, is just after Judith's announcement. Let's listen. Well, I... I congratulate you both. That's very sweet of you, Miss Foster. Knowing how close you and John used to be, I wanted you to be the first person to know of our plans. You're, you're very considerate. It seems to me that it was unnecessary to be quite so abrupt with the announcement, Judith. Abrupt? Oh, my dear, I didn't intend to be abrupt. Was I, Miss Foster? Not at all. After all, there's no point in being subtle about such a thing. Indeed, no. I was certain you'd want to get the news directly, dear. Well, I appreciate your thoughtfulness, Miss Bond. I appreciate it very much. Well, good luck, John. Oh, you're not leaving yet, are you? Yes, I, I really must be getting back to the office. Dad's a bit rushed today. But uh, won't I see you again before we go to Fitzmorris? Oh, that depends upon when you're going. Just as soon as John is able to travel. Dr. Dunbar seems to think that'll be very shortly. Several more days. At any rate, Mary, I'll call around to say goodbye to your mother and father. I, I wouldn't think of leaving without seeing them. And I'll probably get a chance to talk to you then. All right, John. It was nice seeing you again, anyway. It was very nice seeing you, Mary. Uh, one thing more, Miss Foster. Hmm? I really wish that John and I could invite you to come to our wedding. But you see, we're not going to be married until we reach Fitzmaurice. We thought it would be appropriate to be married in the university chapel. I'm sure it will. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Mary. Well? Mary. What? Oh, Oh, it's you, Helen. I'm sorry. I didn't notice you sitting there. That's all right, honey. I came over here thinking you might... might want me to walk home with you. I know, darling. You thought I'd be miserable after talking to John, huh? Well, I didn't think it was going to be any fun for you. No, you're quite right. It wasn't. Oh, that fresh air seems so good after I've been around her. Yeah, I'll bet. But I'm not miserable, Helen. I'm mad. I'm so darn mad, I... I'm seeing red. Good. That's all right. Stay that way for a while. You mad at her? No, at myself. Huh? Of all the silly, empty-headed idiots in this world, I am the prize. Well... Yes, I am. You were perfectly right, Helen. Dad was right. I've been stubborn and unreasonable about the whole thing. Oh, I'd like to fire something. Go ahead. Pick up a rock and heave it. Heave it through a window if that'll help you any. A thing like that's good for the soul every now and then. The idea of my sitting smugly back, breaking my engagement to John, just because he insisted on retaining her as his nurse, uh, well, I must have been crazy. Yeah, that's right. I'm with you on that one. I played right into her hands. Sure you did. However, you can get John back again. I know you can. I'm afraid not this time, Helen. Well, why can't you? He's still in love with you, isn't he? Evidently not. He's going to marry her very shortly. What? That's right. Mary, what are you talking she about? She told me herself just before I left. Huh? She said they were to be married as soon as they reached Fitzmaurice. But, well, what did John have to say to that? He didn't deny it. Oh, for Pete's sake. So, it all comes down to this. I've made a beautiful botch of everything. If she thinks I'm going to sit idly by and allow John to marry her, she's crazy. Well, that's more like it. If you love a man, he's certainly worth fighting for. You do love John, don't you? I love him more than anything else in the world. Okay, then. Get busy. 
Let's see, they're, they're planning to leave for Fitzmaurice within a few days, just as soon as Dr. Dunbar, Dunbar says it's all right to travel. Uh-huh. But they mustn't leave. At least John mustn't. I've got to find some way to keep him right here in Valley Springs. Well, is that going to do any good to keep him here? If he stays, she'll stay too. I know, but I certainly can't do any good if I'm here and he's in Wisconsin. She can marry him here just as well as she can there. I'm not trying to borrow trouble for you, honey, by saying that. I'm just trying to foresee obstacles. I know, I know. Listen, a moment ago you said you didn't think John was still in love with you. How do you know he isn't? Well, he can't be if he's going to marry her. Oh, yes, he can too. He can still be very much in love with you. He's just a victim of circumstances, I'd say. Well, in what way? In two ways. First, because, as you say, you were unreasonable about his firing Judith Bond. And second, because a man convalescing from an illness is very easy prey for a good-looking, smart nurse. The grateful patient idea, you know. And John was double easy for her because she knew him so well, having been engaged to him once before. So you see, Mary, he could still very easily be in love with you and yet have committed himself to marry her. Mm, I wish I knew more about her. You must admit, Helen, that we hardly know anything about her. Right. Except that she's smart. Mm, if I did know something of her background, it might help a lot. Well, let's find out. Well, how? I don't know at the moment, but we're both reporters, Mary. We certainly should be able to find out something. We will, darling, we will. Say, whose car is that in front of the office? Unless my eyes are wrong, there are two cars there. Oh, well, one of them's Doc Dunbar's, the other one, I mean. I don't know. Not a bad bus, though, is it? I wouldn't mind owning one like that myself. Probably belongs to someone who's calling in to see Dad on business. Mm. Oh, there's Doc. Wait a minute, Helen. I want to talk to him. Oh, Doc! Doc! Hello. Hey, hi, Mary. Hello there. How's World Union these days? <laughs> Reasonably well, and you? Oh, can't kick, I guess. Sleep well. That is, when I get a chance to sleep. <laughs> my digestion's in fine working order, and I can still laugh at things pretty often. Man can't ask more than that now, can he? Well, I guess you're right, Doc. But uh, here's what I wanted to find out from you. How soon do you think John will be able to travel? John Dennison? Uh-huh. No, I don't know. Guess he could make a short trip right now if it was necessary. Then he could go to Wisconsin in a few more days. Well, I suppose so. Why? He ain't thinking of going, is he? Certainly is. <laughs> well, that's funny. He didn't say anything to me about it. Doc, uh, well, you'll keep this confidential, won't you, what I'm about to say? Oh, I won't tell more than 20, 30 people, Mary. <laughs> Which, of course, will be keeping it a strict <laughs> secret. <laughs> no, of course, I won't say anything to anybody. What is it you want to say? I don't want John to go back to Fitzmaurice. Any reason why I should? He's going back there to teach. And, incidentally, to marry Judith Bond. What? To marry her? Yes. What, you mean he went and threw you over for that one? Well, it was my fault, Doc, but there's no need of going into that now. Well, by George, I ain't got as much respect for John as I had before. Why, why, why there ain't any comparison between you and that girl... You can't even be mentioned in the same breath. You're so far ahead of her. Uh, why, why, blast his hide. He, well, he, I wondered if there was any way you could keep him here in Valley Springs another week or so. Well, now, I don't know, Mary. I can try, certainly. I suppose I really shouldn't ask you, but... Of course you should. I'll do all I can to help you out. I was just thinking, though, that I wish you'd mentioned it to me the other day. I've already told John that he could be discharged shortly now. Oh, I see. Mm, that does make it difficult. Of course, Miss Bond knows just as well as I do when he'll be able to travel. If I should go to him now and say, look, John, I've changed my mind. You'd better stay right here in the hospital another week or so. Well, she'd think it was mighty funny. Mm. And besides that, John's got a mind of his own, you know. He's no fool either. But I'll do what I can, Mary. I'd appreciate it, Doc. Yeah, and you can count on me to do something. I'll think it over and see what I can hit on. Get in touch with me later, and we'll see what's what. All right, Doc, and thanks. All set, Mary? Mm, I guess so. Doc's going to see what he can do about keeping John in Valley Springs a little while longer. Well, good luck to him. My golly, look at that automobile. Whoever owns that must have plenty of money. Oh, pardon me for changing the subject. <laughs> That's all right. Boy, it is quite a car, isn't it? And here, I believe, comes its owner. Well, he's not so bad either. Oh, how do you do, girls? Uh, which one of you is Mary Foster? Uh, I'm she. Oh, sure, of course. I should have known it. You resemble your father. Oh, uh, my name is Drake, Ben Drake, and I can't say how happy I am to meet you. Well, do you wish to see me? I sure do, and I am seeing you. I've just been talking with your father, and there's a picture of you on his desk. Oh, but boy, that picture doesn't tell a half of it. Oh, lady, you're nice. Oh, and your friend's name is... Miss Mr. Randall. Oh, charm, Miss Randall, delighted. <laughs> it's seldom that one runs across two such lovely girls. Where'd you learn that line, in college? <laughs> no, I was born with it, honey. I'm sorry, I have to go now, but I'll be back. Now that I've seen you two, I just can't be kept away. Well, toodaloo, pets, toodaloo. <laughs> 
Well, you do find them like that every now and then. Hello, Mary. <laughs> Hi, Dad. Hello, Helen. Hi, well, didn't I just see you two talking to young Drake? Mm, I'm afraid you did, Daddy. <laughs> kind of a breezy cuss, ain't he? I'd say he was more of a gale. Oh, what does he do? Well, he was trying to sell me some paper. His father's in the print paper business over to Tilton. Pretty wealthy folks, I gather. Oh, and that car cost plenty. Oh, yes, I guess the boy don't have to worry much. It was pretty apparent he don't take the business very serious. <laughs> Just does it, you know, because his father wants him to pretend to work anyway. Yeah, he's what you'd call a playboy, according to my way of thinking. Well, you see John, did you, Mary? Mm-hmm. Yes, I saw him. How is he? Oh, all right. Well, that's good. Well, I better be getting back to work again. You know, Helen, hmm? I have an idea that young man will be useful. What do you mean? In connection with John and Judith? In connection with Judith. I don't know how just yet, but I think he'll be useful. What has Mary in mind? And will she be successful in keeping John Dennison in Valley Springs? Listen to the next episode of Mary Foster, the Editor's Daughter. Today I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, but not without doing yourself one, too. What's more, your family will thank you if you take this tip. Just buy a loaf or two of Kroger's Clock Bread. Bring it home and pile it high on a plate at your very next meal. Just watch how your family really digs in once they experience the extra freshness in each and every slice. Clock bread is fresher, you know, because it's time-controlled from oven to truck to store. It reaches your table at the peak of its fragrance and deliciousness. And you can feel safe and sure about serving it to children because every ingredient in clock bread must pass rigid scientific laboratory tests for wholesomeness and quality. The real point of my story is this, however. After you've seen what a luxury loaf clock bread is, take stock of the money you can save on it. True, it may be only two, three, or four cents a loaf. But think what those few pennies a day can mean when you serve clock bread regularly. Many women report they can save as much as a dollar a month. Just on clock bread, remember. Give this miracle value a chance to prove to you what a money saver it can be. Next time you need bread, switch over to the guaranteed loaf, the miracle value, Kroger's Clock Bread. Here is your local announcer. Oh yeah, this episode is big. It's huge. It's massive. And uh, have you ever? Well, maybe some of you have, but that's just, you know, I just wonder what happened next. And of course, as much as I would like to know, uh, I have no idea what happens next, nor do I have any idea where I would even begin to look for the next episode. And have you tried that clock bread baked with a clock? I don't even understand the concept, but they sure, I guess they weren't selling soap. They were, it was a bread opera. And, and, and God, she's going to win that guy back. You can guarantee that. She's not going to take any of that nurse's guff, I don't believe. Oh, what a wonderful episode. And um, we got lots more to come. There's a lot of appreciation. Um, tomorrow night, I am performing one of my patented uh, audio poem collage thingies at the local Truth or Consequences Art Hop. And that should be great fun. I hope I amuse people or at least make them stop and think because this time instead of a gallery setting we're taking it back to the streets I am going to be set up in front of Ingo's art cafe and mocktail bar just playing audio collage with sound effects and more likely than not uh, we'll have a special episode or segment I would like to for the most part stay at the half hour length but I'm th I as I mentioned earlier I think these things are gonna kinda grow and the uh, super appreciator the expanded appreciator the appreciator plus 
whatever the uh, super large format that I'm kind of thinking of turns out to be, even that could happen. Although, I don't know. I, it, I am always open for comment. Would you think that a four to seven hour long extravaganza of presentation with a little uh, night radio talk of me uh, commentating or whatever it is that you call what I do that be interesting? Well, do you know where to leave comments. You can leave it wherever you heard this, be it on the Overnight Scape Underground post, on Facebook, or on the Tube of You, yeah, YouTube. And in the meantime, I will say that uh, you should always, when you leave here, set the controls for the heart of the fun. <laughs>